Foie gras is universally cruel because it's made by force-feeding ducks or sometimes geese. Massive quantities of food to enlarge their livers. Physiologically, ducks are waterfowl and they're fundamentally different than human beings are. This is foie gras, fattened duck or goose liver, a modern day delicacy with a culinary history stretching all the way back to ancient Egypt. Many people don't know what it is, but there's a small group of activists determined to ban it. The city of Chicago imposed a ban that was repealed a short two years after it took effect. The state of California passed a ban that goes into effect in July of 2012. Mark Pastore owns an Encanto restaurant in San Francisco, and he wants to continue being allowed to serve foie gras. Foie gras is, is a special food. It's not a food that one would eat every day. It's something that is often might be used to celebrate occasions. When we start taking away foods that can play that kind of role uh, in culture, I think we start to diminish our culture. I think we're losing our freedom. Roland Passu owns La Folie restaurant in San Francisco and is also against the ban. This is the land where you can really blossom and do a lot of things that other countries don't let you do. And I applaud America for that. But when I see that, I'm saying, are we going backwards? We're not talking about a product that, uh, that anybody thinks should be consumed really, except for a small handful of chefs and promoters. It's not something that, that anybody is particularly committed to. It's, it's not something that's, uh, that's really um, important, and it's, it's something that's extremely cruel. Brian Pease, founder of the Animal Protection Rescue League, says that banning foie gras is a pressing animal rights issue. You're actually seeking to induce a disease in the animal. Essentially, you're, you're creating a, a liver that's, that's uh, ten, over 10 times its normal size. Foie gras is not the result of a cruel uh, practice. Balin Linekin is an attorney and founder of the Keep Food Legal Foundation, a group that helped overturn the Chicago foie gras ban. He says that that the force feeding process is not as brutal as opponents make it out to be. It's a, a bird that can digest or can swallow a, a fish whole, a large fish, swallow that without having any sort of uh, repercussions. It's a process that lasts a couple weeks. You feed the bird and at some point they, rather than being afraid of the, the person who's giving them the food, they actually come over to eat the food. The producers here in the United States, and there are only three, are very, very, very small and they work under what I would characterized as an artisan method of production. I don't know what, art, what artisan is supposed to mean, but you know, I've, having been in this farm, if that's what artisan means, I don't want anything artisan on my plate. The process of gavage, which is feeding the ducks through a funnel, uh, is handled in a very careful way uh, with the foie gras producers here in the United States. And many of the images that the anti-foie gras folks use are really images that are lifted from more industrial foie gras producers that you might find in other countries around the world. This is some of the inside footage that Peace took of various farms around the world and has posted on his website. The way we got the footage was just by going to the farms. We'd go at nighttime so we, and we could just, if we didn't you know, break in or anything like that, we just walked in and the, the ducks are being force fed three times per day. So but when you say you didn't break in, you mm -hmm. mean what do you mean? You, but you were invited, or no? We weren't invited either. So okay. we, we walked in. So when I say we didn't break in, I mean we didn't break any lock. In other words, the door was unlocked. We didn't have to climb any fences or anything. Trespassing to get footage of supposed animal cruelty is one thing, but chefs and farmers have also accused anti-foie gras activists of stealing ducks and vandalizing their property. In 2003, one chef even received a threatening videotape of his family and multiple notes reading, stop or be stopped. Certain chefs and farmers have told me that they've been threatened and vandalized by anti-foie gras folks. I think like 10 years ago that happened, and they're still talking about it, so. Did you or your organization have anything to do with it? Yeah, that? no, that was, some, that was an isolated case of something that happened, and that's one of the things that chefs that, that want to dig in their heels and, and keep serving it will say, they'll use that as some kind of justification that some, you know, Laurent Manrique was vandalized back in 2003. So, all right, what, you know, what do you want me to do about that? Chefs and farmers tend to bring up the string of threats, vandalism, and lawsuits that occurred in 2003 
because these intimidation tactics led directly to a settlement between Pisa's group and California's only foie gras farmer, paving the way for the anti-foie gras legislation. But it was because of these threats that Pastore decided to begin serving foie gras in the first place. I think the only way that you ultimately stop bullying tactics is to stand up to them. Some other restaurateurs, some notable ones like Wolfgang Puck that essentially waved the white flag immediately. I don't think that they actually helped promote a good discourse on this issue. While Pease and his organization have won the California foie gras fight for now, Linekin is optimistic that the failed Chicago ban offers some hope for the future of food freedom. The Chicago ban, I guess if there's any one big lesson, it's that ultimately choice trumps. Um, it should and it does. And individual rights are the most important thing that we have as Americans. So we could shoot at not eat raw food, raw milk, raw butter. We should not eat foie gras. What is next? The fish, uh, the chicken, uh, the beef, the pork. Where are we going to stop? Yeah, the